everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today I am going to be talking about the case of Amber Hagerman, which is the girl behind the Amber Alert. I have wanted to talk about this case for a long time, mostly because, yes, what happened to this nine-year-old girl is horrible and should have never happened, but because of this, so many good things have come out of it, so many children have been saved, and I feel like we should be able to talk about the, I feel like the one who saved all of these children. Amber Hagerman, she was born on November 25th, 1986 in Texas. She had a younger brother, Ricky, who was four years younger than she was. Their mother, Donna, was 18 years old when she found out she was pregnant with Amber. Donna, as a teenager, she would often walk around her neighborhood with her friends, and one day while she was doing this, Richard Hagerman was out doing yard work, and they started talking, and before they knew it, they were dating. Even though he was a full 12 years older than she was, they didn't care. Donna talks about when she found out she was pregnant, and she remembers feeling terrified scared, all sorts of emotions. When Amber was around seven, uh, Richard started drinking a lot more. He was always a very violent person when he was drinking, and Donna says that he was abusing her but would never touch the children. Richard would often go out and party with his drinking buddy named Mike, and he would often come home and drink more, and it would just be an endless vicious cycle. The neighbors often called the police because of the noise. Donna remembers that the last time the police came to the house because of her and Richard fighting, that they said they were going to take away the children if they had to come back again. And Donna knew that she had to get out of the house. She just packed up some of their things and left, and they stayed in their car for a few days before going to a women's shelter. She said she couldn't go to her parents' house because she knew Richard would find her there. The women's shelter, they helped her get on welfare, they helped her find an apartment for her and her children. And it took almost a year for them to actually be happy again and not be afraid of their father anymore. Living in this apartment, money was very tight and Amber was always worried that they were going to run out of money. But her mother constantly reassured her that they would always have food on the table. Amber was the type of person who cared about everyone she encountered. She would always watch over everyone and she was like the little mother of her group of her friend group. Amber, she was a Girl Scout. She was very much into the Girl Scouts and she loved to sell the Girl Scout cookies. Richard tried again and again to get Donna and the kids to move back in with him, but she knew that if her and the kids moved back in, that he would just go right back to his drinking. At the time of her kidnapping, Amber was still a little leery of him. She didn't want him to start drinking again. While Donna was at the women's shelter, this film crew approached her and asked if they could film a documentary about how women, single mothers, get off of welfare. Donna agreed to let them film her for a few months, and in August of 1995, they began filming for this documentary. And this is why they have so much footage of Amber, because she was in this documentary. One of the things that was filmed in this documentary was Amber's ninth birthday party, where she wore a blue polka dot dress. She had a cake, ice cream, she opened presents, she played with her friends, and it was just a good day. The fact that they have all of this footage of Amber will come into major play later in this case. Skipping forward to January of 1996, Donna, Amber, and Ricky, they go over to Donna's parents' house to play, ride their bikes, just visit with their grandparents, and have a nice time. And it was fun for the kids to go over there because living in this apartment, they didn't really have anywhere to ride their bikes or to be able to play outside. And at their parent, her grandparents' house, Amber and Ricky did have that opportunity to ride their bikes around the block, to play outside in the yard. After arriving and saying hello to their grandparents, Amber and Ricky immediately got on their bikes and they were just gonna go around the block. Donna told them to stay in that area and to not go any further. But Amber and Ricky, they really wanted to go to this abandoned Winn-Dixie parking lot because it had this cool ramp that you could ride your bike up and down. Amber said goodbye to her mother and that was the last time anyone in her family saw Amber alive. Ricky got afraid that after a few minutes, they were gonna get caught. So he asked if he could go home and asked Amber to come with him. But she wanted to ride her bike on the ramp for a few minutes. 
and she was like, I'll be right behind you. Just go ahead and go. But by the time Ricky got back to his grandparents' house, Amber was not behind him. And so him and his grandfather, they get in the truck and they go and get Amber. But when they get to the Winn-Dixie parking lot, the only thing that is there is her bike. Amber is nowhere to be found. So let's back up a little bit and let's tell what happened. So a 78 year old man sees this entire thing. He sees a little girl in the Windacy parking lot who we know as Amber. This man had driven up right beside her, took her off of her bike, lifted her right up off of it. Her feet never even touched the ground. She screamed, she kicked, he got her in, the, in his truck and he took her away. So the 911 call was already placed when Ricky and his grandfather get there. And when the police get there, so is her grandfather and Ricky. People are figuring out very quickly that this little girl, Amber Hagerman, was kidnapped. It just still baffles me to this day that someone saw the whole thing and they can't figure out who it is. I realize that they worked very hard and there's the time the timing. It was the 90s. They didn't have the technology that we do today. But it just still baffles me that we don't know who did this. As soon as she could, Amber's mother contacted the news outlets, the FBI, anyone she could think of to get the word out about her daughter's disappearance. The neighbors immediately begin searching for Amber and they all, they all are out in the streets. They are in the woods. They are searching everywhere they can for this little girl. Police started looking for anything they could use in that parking lot that they it could be used as evidence, but they found nothing. Not a cigarette butt, not like a wrapper or a water bottle, nothing. They soon had people patrolling the entire city of Arlington, Texas, looking for this black truck and this little girl with dark brown hair. Even then, people were saying, oh gosh, we wish there was this method that we could get information out faster. Donna talked to every single camera she could find, and she was begging for whoever had Amber to please let her go. At the time, her and Richard were not getting along, and she remembers when he got the word that she was missing. Even though they weren't getting along, they banded together because they knew they had to find their daughter. By day three of Amber being gone, they still did not have a suspect. They suspected Richard Hagerman at first, but he was actually on surveillance footage going through his storage building at the time that Amber was kidnapped. So he was cleared. And even Donna said later that she never suspected Richard would have anything to do with it or would do anything like that. They also looked into his friend Mike as well, but he was also cleared eventually because he was out of town for work on that day. Four days after Amber is abducted, there is a big storm in town, big old thunderstorm, and somebody places a 911 call telling them that they were just walking their dog when the dog started sniffing around and found a human body in the creek. The site of the discovery was less than five miles from where Amber was taken from. The body was positively identified as Amber Hagerman the next day. She had been found naked except for one sock. She was floating face down in a creek and it was behind this apartment complex, which will also come into play later. She was caught up in some brush, but she was also floating in the creek. She had severe wounds to her neck and chest area and her official cause of death was her throat being slashed. Now, here's the weird thing about this, and I still don't know how to feel about it. The person talking to the family, like the liaison between the family and the police, the police told them that they found this body, and then that liaison was informed that they had five minutes to inform the family before they let this out to the news outlets. They decided pretty early on not to air this welfare documentary because of what happened to Amber. And it was actually supposed to air on the day that her body was found. Based on the condition of her body, police believe that Amber was killed very close to or exactly where she was found. And you know, running water, rain, water in general, it destroys all kinds of crucial evidence. So they had literally almost nothing to go on. There was not any injuries that would indicate her body had been hit by branches, rocks, had, you know, been floating down the creek as opposed to laying right there. As I mentioned earlier, there was an apartment complex right in front of that creek where her body was found. Police first expected that 
they, it could have been anybody who lived in that complex. They looked into maintenance workers, gardeners. They looked into the electricians that worked in that building. Of course, they looked into the residents of the building, the administration, anyone they could think of that would have been familiar with that complex. A uh, Stuart Coker, he was the one who found the body. He was walking his dog after this big storm and he was just walking along this creek when his dog alerted to something and that's when he found the body. But he was eventually cleared as well. They looked into him. As I said, Amber's throat was slashed. There was stab wounds to her neck and her chest area, but not much else was done to the rest of her body. There was no evidence of sexual assault, but of course we can't also rule out that there was some sort of sexual motive to this crime. So Amber, she was taken on a Saturday, but police don't believe she was killed until the Tuesday or Wednesday after she was taken, that she was being held somewhere. But the weird thing about that is that there were no signs of torture. There were no signs of restraint. So who was keeping her there and what were they doing without any restraints that was making her stay there? Amber's funeral was held at the First United Methodist Church in Arlington, Texas and a little over 2,000 people showed up to this funeral. And police, they were walking around the entire thing to see if anyone looked out of place. Because it is a common thing that somebody who has killed somebody else will go to the funeral. A few months after everything had taken place, there was a woman who came forward and said she saw the entire thing. She gave a witness statement, she gave a description of the truck, and she even gave a license plate number. And these policemen, they they looked into this majorly. They even got with the Ford Motor Company and they together compiled a list of black trucks and who owned them in that area. But a few months later, this woman admits to making the entire story up. And she said that because she saw Donna on the news and through some way in her brain, she figures that this will give her some closure if she just lies about it. I, I just don't understand her logic there. So a woman named Diane Simone, she comes up with the idea for the Amber Alert. And she was thinking that, gosh, there has to be some way that we can get information out faster. What is a way we could do this? Radio broadcast. That's what the Amber Alert started out as was radio broadcast. So she came up with the idea and they were going to use this Amber Alert. All the local radio stations, they would have a description of the vehicle, a description of the suspect, and a description of the child that was kidnapped. They would play this on the radio stations so that way they would have eyes and ears out on the road and it would be just regular citizens. And now I want to tell you about the very first child that was saved using an Amber Alert. It was nearly three years after Amber was kidnapped and murdered, and the baby's name was Rayleigh Ann Bradbury. She was a two-month-old baby that was kidnapped by her babysitter in Arlington, Texas. Rayleigh's mother lived in the city her whole pregnancy, and she said that everyone she encountered was so nice and so caring. And she eventually meets this woman named Sandra Fallis, and Sandra Fallis eventually becomes the babysitter. That morning, Patricia dropped Rayleigh off at Sandra's house, and then she heads off to work. But when she returns to the house, after work, nobody's there. She got panicked. She called local hospitals to see if maybe there was a car accident with a baby and a woman, but there was nothing, and she eventually called the police. Police decide that this is the perfect time to use this new Amber Alert. And about 30 minutes later, Someone calls the police and tells them that because of this Amber Alert they heard on the radio while they were driving, they spotted this car and it was right in front of them. License plate number matched and everything. And they found the baby. They found the woman, they arrested her, and the baby was brought back safe and unharmed. So Rayleigh, all these years later, she was actually in a documentary that I watched on this case when I was researching. Rayleigh says that she thanks Amber every day nearly for saving her. And she's certain that she wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for her. She even said that she sometimes just prayed to Amber. She talked to her thanking her for not only saving her, but saving countless children from the same fate that she suffered. That's what I want to reiterate. Like at the beginning of this video, like I said, Amber's murder was something horrible that happened. 
and something that should have never happened. There was something good that came out of something so awful. And it was that Amber, even all these years later, continues to save children. And Ricky, her brother, says that every time he's driving and he hears an Amber alert, he's like, okay, sis, do your thing. And she does. So yeah, that was my video for this week. I hope you all enjoyed it. Please tell me what you thought about it and I will see you all next week. Oh, I forgot to tell you all to follow my social media. Yeah, do that. And now I will see you guys in my next video.